So it's Saturday, May 18th, 2019. And Oroville Dam, the current water level is 890.95, 890.95. And we, as we know, the emergency spillway is at 901 is where it starts spilling. So we're under 10 feet now. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, a number of people, as you know, have asked us to comment lately because there's there's great concern because the public in the area beneath that dam feels, I think, that uh, they've not been properly communicated to and that nobody's shooting straight with them. And I think that's an accurate assessment. I don't think that, uh, I think they've been lied to constantly by these people. The dam is a couple of years older from the tragedy that nearly happened. And nothing has changed in the administration of the dam. So the same people are communicating now. They communicated back then and told us there was nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about. And in fact, they're the same people that after the event, which at very least scared the heck out of a whole lot of really good people, made the statement that everything worked as it should have, which uh, I, I completely wholeheartedly disagree with. So that is the biggest issue, is that the reason that people have this because they've been abused for so long and, and misled and lied to and had things hidden from them for so long that it's a reasonable way to act. Also, while we're, while we're doing this, Lisa, I also want to talk about us um, because I think it's important. We've gotten a number of calls from a number of people um, asking me for a copy of my CV, which is basically a detailed resume and um, semi-threatening calls. I had a lady call from the Association of State Dam Safety Officials asking me not to use their name in my writing. Um, we were members of ASDO for, what, 10 years or so, at least, yeah. maybe more. Yeah. And we were active. yeah, we were very active in ASDO. We flew all over the country to their conferences, and um, we gave papers, and and wrote articles that were published in their newspapers. And, and we're, we're strongly involved, um, even even offering our boat to entertain people that were at one of their functions, as I remember. So uh, I was kind of shocked when the lady who I believe is the president of ASDO, is she? Uh, wrote, wrote me on LinkedIn and asked me not to use their name anymore. Um, if this happened within a day of being called by an engineer who explained to me that, that I, I didn't understand anything about dams and engineering and that um, basically I didn't know what I was talking about. So uh, now, of course, the trolls who are employed to make comments when I write anything about Oroville Dam, immediately jump on any thread that even mentions my name and call me names and, and act childlike. So I want to talk about who Lisa and I are. I think it's very important that, that we talk about that. Lisa ran a construction company for about 20 years that did nothing but dams, uh, dredging, underwater construction with helmet divers and very, very um, critical and highly technological dam repair work. And uh, in that period of time, uh, we probably did hundreds of dams, I think, fair thing. I believe myself to be, and I believe Lisa to be, among certainly uh, certainly experts, but probably some of the more well-rounded experts in that we did many different disciplines of construction and we did many different kinds of dam repairs. 
Also, I think it's important to point out, a number of people have called me an engineer in referring to me. And I think it's important that people understand that I am not an engineer. That's not what I do. I'm a construction guy. I'm a contractor. That said, I, we did own an engineering firm for a couple of years um, called Dam Safety Engineering. We found over those couple of years that it concerned a lot of the large engineering firms that we did work with that we had our own engineering firm basically competing with us, and we closed that down. That was called uh, Dam Safety Engineer, and we employed engineers doing uh, uh, modeling for hydrology and doing the engineering of dams exclusively. Uh, and that was exclusively in Virginia that we did that. But, but that's not who we are. We're about construction, and we have done many items of construction that others have not done that were notable enough to be published in international magazines and things like that. Now, if one wants to question who we are or who I am, I've been in construction since God was a child, and I've published my CV with a list of many projects, not every project, but many, many projects that I was involved on, and the publications, uh, I acted as uh, an expert for uh, many uh, lawsuits involving dams. I acted as an expert for CBS Evening News and CBS local affiliates regarding dams, infrastructure in general, and specific dams. And I have a full resume post. So anyone who considers me a wackadoodle or a nut job and I'm, I'm using others' words here, may read that CV, and, um, you know, I'm sure that, that the critics will, will criticize it, but it's there, so everyone can understand who's talking. That's who we are. We are very serious people. Um, I recently got, uh, someone said that I ordered an evacuation. I did not ever order an evacuation. I never will. I I don't have the authority or the desire to do so. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say before we start, and I know this is long-winded, but I think it needs to be, is that I don't know what has transpired at Oroville Dam with the new... And in fact, it's been carefully kept secret, effectively. Um, one of the reasons is that we may be terrorists. And we may be looking for a weak link in that dam. So that's the reason that they have to hold this information close. Uh, the engineer, by the way, who called me and, and uh, basically installed it, he was a nice enough guy. Don't get me wrong. And I'm sure he's a very competent engineer. But he turned out to be the engineer on the spillway replacement, oddly. Um, and so, anyway, here we are. If you think it's appropriate, Lisa, I'd like to talk about how this spillway failed the first time around. And this will take some time, so tell me how you want to do it. First, let's talk about this time around, because I think people's discomfort level is now. So, why? what's going on with the spillway now? Why does it seem that they, they checked the gates back in March, and then they opened the spillway in April. That's that's all subjective. So it's a secret what's going on with the spillway now. What we know is that they said they would operate it at a given elevation. They did operate it for a short period of time, and then they stopped operating it. And then a bunch of pools and hard hats and little orange vests climbed all over the spillway and climbed up ladders and climbed down ladders and got on cherry pickers and, and looked at the backside of the tainer gates. It, now, you know, appearances, and that's all I can speak to. You know, I don't even have a set of the plans. But appearances are that something didn't go well. That's, I think, that if something had gone well, that they would now be operating that spillway and responsibly managing the dam. I think they were surprised. I've heard rumors to that effect, and rumors don't mean anything. That's all they are. But... They operated the spillway, it operated, they stopped, and they went and 
crawled all over it, and then they didn't operate it again. So, I mean, take from that whatever whatever value that has. That's the situation that we've seen. We know that the gate structure is flawed. We know that there are issues with the gate structure. We know that the gate structure, which has serious issues, including cracks that were 16 feet long the last time I saw reports on it, uh, they didn't get smaller over this period of time. And we know that those gates now have almost the maximum pressure of water against them. And these are not insignificant amounts of pressure. This is uh, about 0.432 pounds per lineal foot of descent per square inch. So if you, so if it's 80 feet, it's about 40 pounds per square inch times 144 square inches per square foot. So it's a lot. It's, it's tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds of thrust against those gates. It certainly is an inappropriate time to be repairing the gates. The appropriate time to be repairing the gates was when there was no water behind it. The gates were in need grievously. I, I, that statement the last time around, I won't go through all that again, but I believe that, uh, I know that some things occurred because I was told that on my phone call that there was a soil mixing, uh, that took place below the crest of the OG weir, which is the emergency spillway structure that maintains the water. And I don't know how successful that was. I can't, I do see an emergence of water downstream and everyone does, and on the slabs of the spillway, and everyone does. I don't consider that normal. I don't consider the gates leaking to the that extent. Is it's not to all the other dams, which are not leaking. So, really, there's not a lot I can say about the construction, Lisa. Um, I've been told that it was three foot deep slabs. I've been told they were seven foot deep slabs. I've been told many different things, but I have no real information to, to make any determination on. And without having my eyes on it, I couldn't do that anyway. What I know is this, Mr. Croyle lied to me. Time and time again, he stood in front of a microphone and he lied to those people. That is true. And the person who replaced Mr. Croyle is cut the same cloth to use an Oppen Baggett's words of the same personality. He rose to that position because he was the one who would do that which was required of him and was not stopped by something, perhaps morality. I don't know. But that's that's all, not all I can say about the construction, Lisa. I've been told there's a cutoff wall. I've been told they use rock anchors. And I've been told that the mass of the slabs are sufficient to offset potential for undulation. I've also been told by the engineer and by others that when they failed us this time, that wasn't from a harmonic at all. That's not what happened there. It was what happened there, or that's what I believe happened. I'm pretty certain of it. Um, I don't know, and, and I don't think anyone knows. I know that a slab that is properly tied down with proper rock anchors, the high recovery rock, is fairly sound, even with water rushing over it at, at very high velocities. And on that hillside, we all know that. We've watched it wash downstream. Um, the other thing that we've discussed along the evolution, people, many people call me and ask me questions. When they ask me questions, I answer them honorably with the information I have. Understand that I don't write the stories. Are you there still? Yes, I'm here. Okay. I don't write the stories, so I'm not responsible for the words that they use beyond the words that I use that they incorporated into the story. So I'm very careful about what I say. And the things that I have said have all been true to the best of my ability. If I made a mistake, 
And I don't believe I have, but if I do, I will tell everyone that the error was made and explain why. But I think that almost everything I've said from day one on Oroville has been proven accurate. So really, I can't discuss the, the construction, Lisa, because I don't have the information. Okay. Except to say that I've been in construction for 50 years and my dad for 50 years before me. And when you've been on that many construction jobs, you can look at a job and tell if it's going well or it's going badly. And that does not look like a job that's going well to me. I think there are a number of issues there. The emergency spillway, the OG as you're calling it, now that it has been um, coded with RCC and supposedly there's a subterranean cutoff wall, um, they're taking the dam level. They intend to take it to 900 with 901 being the magic number for the emergency spillway. Um, if water does wind up flowing over that, what will happen? Will we be looking at a scenario like we were in 2017, or has all this construction made it completely safe and we have no worries, or somewhere between? We know what happened the last time around. And I, I keep slipping back to that because I had data on that, and, and that has been hidden from me on this. So then... Uh, the OG weir actuated, the, the water got up to 901, and water began to spill over the OG weir. Understand, water barely spilled over the OG weir. The storm event that initiated that actuation of the emergency spillway at 901 was 4% of the probable maximum storm, probable maximum flood, which was referred to as PMF or or PM. So this is a, an absolutely insignificant amount of water compared to what the dam should sustain. The dam is required to sustain 100%. It failed at 4% the last time. Personal beliefs, I don't think there's a snowball's chance that this dam will suffer the PMF and remain intact. Do you? No, I do not. But, no. No. but the incident that could occur Hopefully. where they don't open the spillway and there is a bit of overtopping and it's maybe maybe something very similar to what happened in 17 as far as the volume of water. Now that they've done all that construction stuff, what do you think? At, at best, the best scenario would be that the same soils, again, erode away into the Feather River, causing a half a billion dollars in additional construction required to replace them on the slope. Um, that would be the best. Of course, we have a tenuous gate structure, and we have a, a slurry cut-up wall, a soil mix cut-up wall, which is really suspect anyway on a dam. Um, and it's kept with RCC, Ed, that's my understanding, I may be wrong about this because I'm pretty much guessing here, but the interface between the two elements of a dam and RCC, which does not have good pull-out strength because it doesn't have good compression strength, and it will not be reinforced either. So they've just been placed. They've just finished the works. Yeah, they're most probably at, at a four percent storm, which is an insignificant storm, which is what it came within forty five minutes of failing the last time with. Uh, it would do significant damage to the dam again. It would cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make the horrible damage and it would also do damage to the work which has been which has been constructed on the emergency spillway. It may also do damage to the gate structures and that element of the dam, depending on how how the uh, you know, the notch is created, uh, how it would migrate. But I mean that's subjective again, but. I don't feel like it's ready 
I don't feel like it's anything near ready, and I, and I haven't felt that way. I think that there needs to be hard meat down to the river. I think there needs to be stilling, and I think the most critical thing, the most critical thing is the entirety of the primary spillway, including the gate structures. This all has to be operational and proper and working so that they can use it. If they can use the primary spillway and be relying on the emergency spillway, that is not acceptable. And that's not acceptable to anyone, to any, any damn safety official or engineer. That's not an acceptable situation with a high hazard dam like this. Yeah, absolutely. Um so we would see the same kind of damage to the hillside, the same kind of huge, massive dirt going into the river if the emergency spillway is activated. Um, and, and as you say, possibly, possibly worse, possibly a failure. If we lived in Oroville, what, what would we do? What would you, how would we be acting now? What would we do and when would we do it? Certainly, we would have gas in the car, and at the point when that thing got up to, to pushing 900 feet, personally, I might, I don't know, I don't want to say that, Lisa, I don't, I don't like it, I don't like it, um, I've been, uh, you know, I've been on dams that were in the process of, failing. I've been on dams that had serious issues where, where, where dam safety officials had called me out to look at them. Um, and in all those situations, the owner of the dam was right there, standing on that broken dam with me, offering to do whatever it took to make this situation right. I've never seen an owner like this who had no responsibility at all. I've never seen an owner like this. I've never seen one owner like these guys. I, there's... I feel like there's something these people wouldn't do. I, you know, when, when Mr. Coyle, after the last ridiculousness and discomfort and terror and everything else that was induced on, on those people of that valley, to stand in front of a television camera and say that everything worked as it should have is disgusting to me. It, it's, it gives you an idea of how the wrong people are running that dam. I've said that since day one, and they continue to run the dam. So that is the problem. That's how it's this way, and that's why we don't know what the real situation is. And just to, to recap something that, that you did mention, um, from the beginning, from the 2017 incident, as we began to learn about it, as even, even though there was a giant hole in the spillway, even though much of the spillway was missing, you and I both continue to believe the gate structure was the priority. The gate structure was tenuous and needed to be addressed, and that was the key controlling structure. That was my belief at that time. Um, I don't know that anything has changed with that. I think that the actions of the people are pretty telegraphed pretty clearly that, that it is an issue. I have been told I don't know this for certain, but I've been told by two people that they hired five experts to go out and evaluate the construction that they were doing. And I asked some people about the OG Weir cutoff, a grouting program, the uh, abutting soils and the uh, water that's moving through them, and the gate structures. And what I was told was that these five experts they hired were told to exclude those from their report and to not look at them and not consider them. They were only to consider the new spillway. So that's, that's not an honorable way to do things if you want to get the dam up to snuff and, and safe. And it's not an appropriate way to treat engineers either, you know, to to confine them to certain things like that when they're doing such an important report. You have to realize that these engineers who are doing this work, if they make a comment like the comments that I make, 
they will never again work for the Department of Water Resources. Also, the Division of Dam Safety, who will be overseeing their work indirectly on everything they do, is a subsidy, subsidiary of DWR. So the regulator that regulates this dam that DWR owns works for DWR. So it's effectively to comment on their bus. And, and it's engineers who need this work for their engineering firms to grow who are asked to make comments. And it's not in their interest to, to say things that will upset DWR. And, and they don't because they rely on them across that state for their work. I don't do any work in California. There's not enough money in the world to get me to do work in California on a dam. Okay, good, good stuff. Um, what else would you like to talk about as far as the dam goes? Um, if you don't want me to talk about the, the how the failure took place in my beliefs the last time, then I will say that it there are some appearances. Remember, we early on when the, before this thing really happened, we talked about the drainage system beneath the uh, plate slabs of the principal spillway, and we said that it was not proper and not working, and that that was indicated by the porting water through the through the events which were up on the training walls. Well, now we see emergence of water the whole way down the spillway, which is very similar um, to those indications and would indicate an improper drainage system below this slab, which would be a horrible situation if that if that actually exists. And I think it's important. I think it's important to talk about how it failed last time. Because Please do. I just, I just wanted it to be at, at this place in the recording and not earlier for editing uh, purposes. I, I think it's really important. The the slabs of concrete on on that structure need to have water on top of them and no water below them. Ideal. If the water beneath the slab, which we call P2, pressure 2, the water above the slab, P1, if the water below the slab is positive to atmospheric pressure, then that creates the potential for contributory on my And the way that works is that you have nodes, slab supported at two points, and it's, it's able to move in the center. There's water beneath it. There's water above it. The water beneath it is stagnant relatively. It's moving, but slowly. The water above it is moving very rapidly. Bernelli's principle says the water above it has a lesser pressure because of the velocity than the water below it. So P1, the pressure above, becomes negative. The pressure below then increases as the slab rises slightly into the negative pressure of P1. P2 is increased. When the slab reaches its maximum cord between these nodes, which is half the the wave rate, um, when it rises, then it begins to fall because of the elasticity of the rod within it. When it falls, P1 increases both from impact and because this sine wave, it's on the back side of the sine wave, and it actually drives the water beneath it into the soils. P2 becomes very sharp and it peaks at the point when that slab is depressed. At that point, you have a very high pressure beneath P2 and a very low pressure above now because. There's a void where this slab was within the laminar flow. And the slab is then thrust up into this negative pressure again. This causes an undulation, which, which is 
eventually destructive to this to the beam section of the plate slab. And that is what happened before. And that is why the soils beneath that slab were so were so easily washed out. Immediately gone. I mean, the minute the slab went, the soils all went. Because they had been effectively liquefied by this pressure induced into them. So they're moving water moved through the soil and back, through the soil and back, through the soil and back, and broke the soil up so that it was free to move. So that's how it happened before. If we see displacement of slabs now, we see indications that perhaps there's water beneath the slabs again. If slabs are being displaced, then I would say it doesn't speak well for the construction on the uh, plate slabs of the so sweat. I think that's important. That's that's my theory. Other others have said that it was due to cavitation. I don't see the velocities as significant enough to cause cavitation. So I disagree with that. I know and, someone online and, pointed out someone online pointed out that the people who were looking at the spillway seemed to be paying a great deal of attention to the corners and the joints. Yeah, I would be. I would be. If the slab is held in place in such a way that it cannot move under the induced forces from the flowing water, if it does not have that P2 pressure beneath it, then the slab will be very, very stable. It will have less pressure down on the slab to its foundation, which is usually stone beneath it in this situation because of the underground drain system. And it, but it will be. It will be an actual pressure down. On. Once water migrates underneath there and you have a flow above and beneath, it's, it's very serious. And when there's significant flow beneath the slabs, you've seen them. I've seen them. It, they fail. They fail. Um, we've stuck cameras under how many spillways and seen caverns beneath them. Some of them you could crawl through. And uh, this is a normal failure mode for these for these slabs. You have a, a dynamic dam, soils that swell and, and contract as they drop. You have this hard structure across the top of them. The hard structure moves at, at completely different. Uh, with thermal expansions, um, the hard structure will not move with hydration and dehydration, but the soils will. And the, the top of a dam moves. It, it, it's, it's very dynamic structure. So this is this place, the junction between the hard and the soft elements of a dam are very easily become conductive to water. If, for instance, the drains became plugged because wrong materials were used, then um, the situation at, at that dam would be probably that they would have to uh, probably have to put a new drainage system in, which would, which would basically mean the removal of the slabs of the spill. So, I don't know the situation, but I don't like the indication of water running down, emerging from, apparently emerging from cracks between plate slabs of the spillway and then running down the face of it. That's, that's not a good sign. Yeah, I agree. And there has even been conjecture about whether they were deliberately leaving the gates a tiny bit open to allow water to flow down in order to disguise water coming up through the cracks. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, that, that's a rumor, and it's it's a reasonable rumor. Unfortunately, that should that should never be the situation. But history, people can't forget when people lied to them and were caught in the lies, and they should not forget that. That is the problem. The problem: the, the dam and the elements of the dam and all that stuff. It, it's a problem, but it's not the great. The great problem is a problem of honor and a problem of integrity. And how do you fix that? I suggest perhaps the new California 
Paul Preston's efforts. I can tell you that I've never seen people in this, the United States of America, that were so poorly represented in my life. I have never seen such a situation. I would not have believed it existed, but for the fact that I went there and I gave that speech and I met those people and uh, they changed a lot of my perceptions and, and I care very deeply for them. That's why we're doing this. Let me tell you, Lisa and I get a sea of threats constantly. Some of them veiled, some of them not. Just because we tell the truth. And we do tell the truth. My God, what, what kind of that we live in. For people that have honorable concerns, that to be, to be molested, but even more importantly than that, to be misinformed and to have the information cloistered and hidden from them. What a, what a shame that is. What a shame. That's all I have, Lisa.